we're going to do a broad stress management presentation today. We'll talk a little bit about the psychological and physiological aspects of stress and then try to talk about some of the techniques that you can use to try to manage your stress. How many of you guys would agree that graduate school is stressful? Okay. I, I'm not sure I saw a hand that stayed down. <laughs> it, it's been about 20 years since I've been in graduate school, and I can tell you things have changed. We didn't have computers at that point in time, which pros and cons. We, we trekked over to the library and spent tons of money in photocopying and everything. But the, the other thing that happened, too, is when we went to sleep, we didn't have 20 emails waiting for us in the morning. So that's a whole different type of stress. So as you get through graduate school, hopefully some of the things that we talk about here will help you manage the stress and have a good time while you're going to school. I know people are like, what's she talking about a good time? But enjoying the in topic that you're studying. So first, the definition of stress, in this broad definition, it is just pressure or strain resulting in some type of physiological or psychological response. So the best way for me to explain this is for you to think about a rubber band and think about pulling that rubber band out. Now what happens if you pull too far? It breaks, doesn't it? Now have you ever used a rubber band over and over and over again? Does it always go back to the same size? It doesn't, because after a while it gets stretched out. And physiologically and psychologically, that's actually what happens to our bodies and our minds as well, is that we're pretty resilient and we're like that rubber band and we can get stretched really far and don't go over the breaking point. But after a while, you just don't go back the same way. So hopefully with these techniques, you feel like that as you go through day to day with stress management principles that you'll cognitively kind of think through, what do I need to do to take care of myself? I think that's probably the last thing people think about when they're in grad school is the whole idea of think taking care of yourself is a pretty foreign concept. Um, taking a break, trying to do anything like that. So we're going to talk a lot about that here in a little bit. Primarily when we talk about stress, we are actually talking about distress. So if anybody wants to take a guess here, when is the time that you have zero stress? No. no. The only time, the, the only time you don't have stress is actually when you're dead. I know, happy topic, isn't it? <laughs> What happens is that you're stressed even in, in, at night. Think about some of your dreams. Our, our dreams are our way of our mind kind of working through the day. Sometimes they're really happy dreams. Have you ever woken up from that dream where your heart is pounding? Mm -hmm. Now that's stress, right? So we never fully escape it, but we can try to minimize it. So really what we're thinking about here is trying to balance between too much stress and getting a lack of stress. So let's talk about the impact of, a la of lack of stress. Have anybody, have you ever found yourself where you didn't, that you didn't, not much stress? And what was your motivation like? It felt good? <laughs> Zero. Well, exactly. And that's really what this bell-shaped curve is talking about here. If you have too little stress, your performance actually goes down. We've known about this for a really long time with athletics. And if you think about it, when that coach is in the locker room, are they meditating before a game? No, what are they doing? <laughs> they're screaming, they're pumping them up, right? Because they want that optimal stress level so they can have peak performance. And that's really, I think, the balance that you try to seek particularly in grad school, is how can I stay in this optimal stress level, not go over to distress, but not burn myself out, that now I go over here to lack of stress. And it's like, pfft, no motivation, burned out, don't, don't know what I want to do about anything. So let's talk about a few facts here. It's an everyday fact of life. As I said, we can't escape it. Stress is in every culture. It's across all regions. It is something that occurs as a result of us being human. You can't avoid it. 
but you can learn how to manage it better. It, the abnormal amounts of stress is really what we're talking about here. That's what we're concerned about that becomes harmful. We know that research has indicated that if we keep people in prolonged periods of stress without any break, they begin to demonstrate signs of symptoms of anxiety and depression. Would anybody be surprised about that? You just start feeling oppressed. Your mind gets cloudy. You lack energy. You really begin to shut down. So trying to stay in the middle of that bell-shaped curve helps keeping that point from keeping the stress from getting to the point that it's harmful. Each of us perceives stress differently, and it's our mind that actually interprets whether or not an event is stressful. There are some people who taking a test, how many of you guys have no problems taking a test? Cool, cool as a cucumber. Good, I see a couple of hands. How many of you guys get a little anxious? Yeah, a lot anxious. Have you ever sat there going, so if I run out of the room screaming, will anybody notice? Right? Got over to the distress part. So you see just the difference in talking about that. Some people find test taking extremely anxiety provoking and other people don't. We also have varying tolerances of stress. Graduate school, I think, absolutely pushes people probably to their max. And when you look back, people say, wow. How did I even function? I was so stressed out. And then it seems a little bit as a fog. And then other people, they go through it and they say, you know, grad school was a breeze. It was undergrad that was harder. So we all interpret things different. And our response will vary from situation to situation. So in, t in testing, I'll use myself for example. I use that specific example because I have a little bit of test anxiety and have actually thought about if I run from the room, will people notice that I'm screaming and yelling. But I also play athletics, had a long time to practice, played competitively, and I can get out on a ball field and not be stressful. In fact, the more pressure I feel, I actually get calmer because of a lot of training. So why would I be so freaked out with a test? because it's my interpretation of what is stressful. And so as you talk among yourselves after this, you may find some real differences in how you perceive things. Now, stressors can either be external or internal. And does anybody ever feel like they look like that cat? Or So we have two groups of stressors. We have the psychological. Give me an example of a social stressor. Absolutely. That's a good social stressor. Yes. Good example. Occupational stressor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interviews. Going to your practicum. I'm going to get a grade on this. This is laying the foundation for me getting a job, right? What about philosophical or spiritual? What might be a stressor there? Mm -hmm. Like the way you live your life or career path you've chosen? Any of those? Or anything? Yeah. I, I cut off that person. <laughs> no, I see what you're saying. The other thing that I see happening in undergraduate and graduate school many times is that folks sometimes feel like they can't practice their spiritual beliefs as frequently or as in depth as, they, as they'd like to because, again, they constantly feel pushed. And the mind says, gosh, if, if I go to church or if I go pray, that's an hour, but that's another hour. Either I could sleep or study, and it presents a little bit of a dilemma for people. The other things that we see, I'm going to try to close this box here. I don't know if I can do that. Does anybody know how to close this box? Drag it out of the way. Well, we're, we're going to skip that. I won't take a lot of time. The other type of stress is physical. So how can exercise be stressful? 
Did you think about that? Any kind of stress. I guess you push yourself to a limit or if you push yourself to the line. Mm -hmm. Maybe a threshold where you have your endorphins are flowing beyond that where your body just begins to shut down. Yeah, exactly. If you keep in that optimal level, that's actually where we see performance increase. You get, you get more strength, you get more balance. If you go into that distress end, that's when you have injury. You begin to shut down. The other type of stress is illness, if you think about it. And when you're ill, your body does not cooperate, does it? It has a mind of its own. It does not matter that you have an interview tomorrow. It does not matter that you have a test. It will shut down and create a lot of stress for you. We all also interpret the various intensity of stressors. And how we interpret the intensity of stressors is, is based on a couple of things. One, it can be based on our impacted, how we're impacted by loss of control. And let me give you an example of an experiment. Of course, as researchers, we tend to put people in rooms and do things to them. And they've agreed upon this, but this is how we get information. So this one study was actually about noise. And what they did with students was they set them in a room some students had a button, some students did not. And loud music was blasted. And the students with the button were told, at any point in time, you can push that button and control the noise level. Well, guess what? The button wasn't connected to anything. It was all perception. But when they measured people's physiological response to stress as well as, well as their self-reported experience to stress, those who felt like they had control of it, even if it was fake, the fake button, were less stressed. So if we feel more out of control, our stress goes up. So in grad school, do you ever get to the point where you feel like you're a little out of control? Or you don't have control of assignments, due dates, anything like that? Whereas if you look at your schedule of tests or things like that, and and I don't know about you guys, but in grad school, mine never were evenly spaced. You know, it wasn't like one test here, one test there. It was like they were all on the same day for whatever reason. It's like, it's like the professors got together sometimes, right? Does it ever feel like that? Yeah. So that loss of control will increase your perception of stress as well as predictability. And again, when we do a lot of psychology experiments, we tend to use a lot of rats and mice. Their brains have similar processes as we do. And this was about predictability. So they would put mice in a maze and they would shock them periodically. And for some of the mice they got a random shock and for others got shocks at certain intervals always. So for example if they turned the corner here and went left they always got a shock. And then another group if they turn left at a corner they may, not, may or may not get a shock. So again, when they went back to measure those mice's physiological, of course we can't get psychological, physiological response to stress, guess what? The mice that knew something was coming had lower stress levels. Why do you think that is? Anybody? Yeah, they prepared, they braced. You know, it was like in their head they said, okay, I know what's coming. I, I know what's gonna happen next. And so, with that predictability as well, we're able to practice probably some cognitive techniques that say, okay, calm down, I'm gonna get through this. Oh, we do a lot of stress management techniques prior to that event to try to go into that feeling a little bit more psychologically or even physically healthy. So let's talk about three phases of stress with our body. And we're gonna go through each one of these, the alarm, resistance, and exhaustion phases. So first, the alarm. How many of you guys are familiar with that fight or flight stage? Good. It is that reptilian part of our brain. It is old, old, old. It, it's there for a purpose. It keeps our species going. And what ends up happening is that reptilian brain decides, oh no, this is a stressful event. And then it tries to decide, am I fighting? Do I need to flee? 
And then we've also, through research and time, added another one, or do I freeze? Kind of that deer in the headlight. Do I just, I can't do anything, I'm so stressed. And that reptilian brain, it has no thinking structures. It is pure reaction and survival. And so what ends up happening is in, the body doesn't think. The body believes there's no time to think. And so it begins to throw all these hormones, stress hormones, cortisol, into our body because it wants our body to start moving. Get out of there. Do what you need to do to survive. And all of those stress hormones, again, at too high of levels, are unhealthy. Then what ends up happening is because the brain is saying danger, 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 it begins to shut down processes that it doesn't think we need. Well, the, one of the first things to go is your thinking. Because if you're running, why do you need to think? Get the heck out of there. Um, let's go that way. Then the other thing it does is it begins to remove all of the blood flow from your extremities. So if you're really, really stressed, kind of a quick tip, unless you're in a really cold room, is to take your fingertips and just put it on your cheek. If you're really stressed, your hands are going to be cold and your, feet are going to be, your feet are going to be cold. Because what happens is the body says, I need to protect the most vital organs because I want you to survive. So everything kind of goes to the heart, the lungs, di digestion shuts down. You don't need to process your food if you're trying to get out of there. Keeps blood flow to the brains, to the brain, sorry. And, and again, it's trying to protect itself. All thought is gone. And again, we can leverage that if we keep it in the middle and we'll see faster reaction times. We'll see positive aspects. Unfortunately for most of us, again, we let it get over into that distress area. Then the resistance phase. This is where the body is saying, okay, we gotta, we've got to soldier through this. Let's keep going. So we have a lot of that cortisol resi uh, released. They want to maintain some of those initial effects in that alarm phase. So you'll see that blood pressure continue to rise. Have anybody, has it, has, how many of you guys have had your blood pressure taken? Okay. Have you ever noticed a difference of what your blood pressure was depending on what you were doing right before that visit? And if you were doing something that your mind or body perceived as stressful, what was your blood pressure like? It was a lot higher because the brain, again, was saying, okay, you're really stressed. I've got to help take care of you. And so you'll see a huge difference there. Also, again, they're dumping the glucose into the muscles because we want you moving quicker and quicker and quicker. Digestion is gone. And what ends up happening is if you don't slow things down, then you start moving to this next phase. And this is that phase of that rubber band where it's getting way too far out there. And then it's, it's the exhaustion phase. How many of you have ever been to that place where you just you can't think anymore? OK. And what, what was it like for you? What did you notice, whether psychologically, physically? You're what? Drained. No energy. OK. Any others? Lack of motivation. Lack of motivation. Exactly. The couch was your best friend for a while. What else? There's some other, there's tons of things that can happen, but a, a few that are kind of quirky is that we can lose the ability to do some math, and we'll develop some word anomia. The whole math thing, when, some, when I first learned about that, I was like, I already can't do it, so that doesn't matter. But simple math, sure, we could do that. And there was a particular time we had a, kind of a tragic event here at Texas A&M, and so I had worked way too many hours. I knew I had. And again, you know, oh, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'll sleep when this is over. And it was about 10 o'clock at night, and I did about probably the most unhealthy thing I could do. I was dying for a Dr. Pepper with caffeine at 10 o'clock at night. And so I go to Taco Bell, and I'm going to get this drink. And so they say, OK, that's 89 cents. And I'm sitting there with my hand, and I'm like, OK, you can do this. You can do this. And I sat and looked at it. And finally, I just held my hand out, and I said, just take what you need. I mean, it was gone. Totally could not think. 
And I remember thinking to myself at that moment going, this is what they're talking about. Oh my gosh, this really does happen. It's not just a theory. And so I, I will say that as a result of that, because I never really experienced that, I, I said, you know, I got to sleep a little bit more. I got to slow down. I got to do something to take care of myself. Because pretty soon, though I think I'm performing really well, I'm probably not. I'm not taking care good enough of myself. So as you get to this mental exhaustion things, your body, if you don't slow things down, your body will shut you down. And you guys were just talking about that exhaustion, no motivation and no energy. That's the body saying, look, you went really overboard. It makes you more susceptible to illness. What I used to find in graduate school, and all of us graduate students talked about this, and I don't know if any of you experienced this, but we would do pretty good to the semester, and then by after finals, of course, you're at your peak of exhaustion, right? Just dead. We all got sick over Christmas. Every doggone time. Has anybody done that yet or, or felt that? That was kind of the pattern we noticed in our program. So it was like, oh my gosh, what was happening? That should be our time off. We're relaxing. Well, we, didn't, we went into the break too exhausted. We were so susceptible to all the germs and illnesses that the body said, aha, gotcha, and, and really shut us down for that time period. So again, another physical warning to us of, look, guys, slow down. Take care of yourself. If you don't, I will. Now, each of us, as we experience a stressor, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to evaluate that stressor based on, okay, do I need to be fearful here? Am I in danger? Is this a stressful event for me? And so here's some of the things that we ask ourselves. Is that stressor irrelevant? Is it harmless? So one of the things that I, I always give an example is, have you ever been sitting in your house and you hear this loud, bang and it sounds like gunfire and it was and initially physiologically your heart's pumping a little bit you go out it was a car backfiring so at first you weren't sure if it was harmless you find out what it is okay now I can relax or does it even matter if I need to be stressed about this then the other thing is is there some sort of threat or challenge happening what ends up, particularly in grad school, is you don't face physical threats. You're safe when you come in the building. You take your test. Nobody's, you know, here to hurt you. But the brain interprets it really as kind of a psychological threat. And for most people in grad school, very high achievers, want to do the best you can, you begin to develop this thinking pattern of, okay, I have to get all A's, I have to do very well, I'm gonna apply for my practicum, I'm gonna get a good review, then I'm gonna get a job, right? You start linking all of that together. And what happens at any of those points if you don't feel like you're doing well? Sometimes the thinking then starts, oh no, they're gonna kick me out of graduate school, what am I gonna do, what career am I gonna have? And again, this negative thought cycle can begin. So many times, it's not physical threats that we're actually dealing with. It's more psychological threats that we've interpreted. Then the coping mechanisms that we have available to ourselves are cognitive the thoughts. And I just gave you that example of thinking patterns that can either increase or decrease stress. So when the car went off and, and I went outside, let's say, and I found out, oh, it's just a backfiring, in my mind, my cognitive structure was, okay, no big deal, car backfiring, everything's safe. Physiologically, everything decompresses. So our thoughts can either increase our stress or decrease our stress. Somebody have an example of a thought pattern or a thought that might increase your stress? So have you ever gone into a test going, oh my gosh, I hope I can pass? And that's kind of going through the back of your head. Yes. Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, yes. Oh, yes. I was always living back home with my parents and not having a career. I mean, it was catastrophic thinking to the max. 
Very much so, and that stress gets elevated. Whereas if you go into the test and you're like, all right, I studied, I know this content, woohoo, I'm good to go. Stress is lowered. Our behavior helps us cope. Can somebody give me an example of a behavior that might be a coping mechanism? Doesn't matter if it's healthy or unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, no, it does, yeah. There's a little bit of pain involved, and it, it escapes from the psychological pain. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Grinding your teeth, Grinding your teeth. yeah. Shaking your leg. Exactly. Yeah, you can kind of watch people when, when they start taking tests. You're so busy filling out your tests that the rest of us watch, but everybody, sh they've got their leg going or they're flipping their pen or pencil. You know, they're moving around in the chair. And then the ones who are really calm are just, nothing's happening. They're very, you know, oh, let's get this going. Neurophysiological types of protections, and this is again where our body can habituate to a little bit of stress. So, for example, in grad school, how far along are you guys? Where are some of you guys at? First semester, sec? First semester. Okay. So, neurophysiologically, when you guys came in your first two to three weeks, would you say things were a little bit elevated, a little bit more nervous? Walking into a class, some of you guys might have been nervous to meet your colleagues, maybe a little bit of heart fluttering and things like that. Now when you go into class, you've gotten used to it, right? And so the body's calmed down, your heart might not race. And so it says, okay, everything's okay. We also have emotional coping mechanisms, and these are any feelings that we have. Some people will talk about whenever they get really, really stressed, for example, they have to cry. And it just lets it all out. And for whatever reason, they feel good. Or some people go and they go out in the woods and yell and they scream, right? Anything to kind of get that stress out. The questions I often get is, why do different people respond to stress differently? And, and it's a question we actually ask in a, a lot of disaster situations when we had two people, for example, that have experienced the same thing during Hurricane Katrina. Why do they come out with one, no symptoms of depression, they're better than ever, and somebody else that has PTSD and depression? They, they went through the same thing, so why aren't why aren't they same in the end? And, and we know that there's a lot of factors that influence that. And first, it can be our family or that genetic wiring that we have. So what are our, the history of physical or psychological conditions that might influence our reaction to stressors? So if we have a history, for example, of depression or, or anxiety that may predispose us to experience higher levels of stress compared to others, if we have a chronic illness, for example, and we have bouts where we get sick, might have to go to the hospital, and then we're okay for months and months and months, again, predisposes us perhaps to experiencing stressors as different. Our personality, have you guys ever met somebody that you think, do they ever get stressed? I mean, just, it always rolls off their back. And then the other continuum is the person that is always wound up constantly. They never, never slow down. Our cultural background, so what has our society taught us about stress? And here in the American culture, one of the things that I've begun to see is that we are extending the definition of what should be stressful, the should there. So if you're only working 40 hours, wow, that's not enough you got to work 50 hours, really, to prove yourself, right? And I, for example, I do my job at A&M, and then I have a small private practice. And so I, I might work 10 hours a day. And people always say, oh, my gosh, how do you do that? And this is not a healthy response. I'll, I'll put that on the table. But I said, you know what? It's less than grad school. I never got home until 10 or 11 o'clock, so this is like a vacation now. Well, my benchmark got really skewed. 
And so what ends up happening sometimes even after graduate school and undergrad is you start to base on what should be on what you had to do to get through grad school or undergrad. And it really should start to slow down for you, hopefully. And then again, our gender. Men and women can experience stress differently based on interpretation, what society tells us we should be experiencing. Our past experiences, remember those experiments that I just told you about predictability and control? So if I've experienced a stressor before and I knew I got through it okay, then my cognitive structure in my head is, oh, okay, I've been through this before, I'm going to be okay, you know what to do. And it reduces the stress. Then what are our lifestyle patterns? What are our past experiences? Grad school, in, in a lot of ways, trains you to think and deal with a lot of stress. Is that a fair comment? I mean, you get, you get put through a lot. And so as you begin to cope better and better for that, if you enter into a job where you might have peaks and valleys of hours you worked, you may say, okay, I did this in grad school. I remember. I can get by on six hours of sleep. And then you go back to taking care of yourself. Then what are our existing vulnerabilities or strengths? What's our health like? What's our motivation to practice healthy stress management? Do we have that support at work or home? How many of you would say that People in your life can be very helpful when it comes to managing stress. They can be supportive. They can tell you it's going to be okay, and you see kind of that reduction. Relationships with our friends, our spouses, our financial situation, other people's health. Do we have children that have a chronic illness or our parents sick? What, what other things do you think might contribute to the way people experience stress? Anybody else have any ideas? A strength or a vulnerability? Okay. Can you, can you give me an example? Yeah, yeah, perfect example, and thank you for sharing that. I, I suspect there's probably a lot of people in this room that have felt that pressure of they have a certain definition of what they have to do. And, and gra you know, in undergrad, you'll hear a lot of graduates, I mean, a lot of students say A's and B's. I'm okay with A's and B's. Then you get in graduate school, and what ends up happening? Nothing less than an A, come on and nothing less than a 98, and even that's not good enough. So you begin to push that bar, and that, again, predisposes us to stress. Then our existing beliefs. We can have spiritual or religious influences. Many people find that their spiritual beliefs, their religious influences help them manage stress. They may have certain phrases that they repeat to themselves, Bible verses, um, rituals that help them really manage and reduce their stress. The other thing is if you have an open communication style, if you talk about your feelings, people tend to manage their stress better versus if they only internalize. What are your moral values? And this accepts health is huge. Help. This is huge. What we're finding, one of the questions, when, remember when I gave that Hurricane Katrina example, why do two people come out different? The person who comes out really with less issues, we're finding that we're using this term called resiliency. And part of resiliency is asking for help when you need it. And in graduate school, that can be a little bit tricky. If you don't have a lot of friends here, if you don't have a lot of personal relationships that are supportive, or if you're away from your family, and you've had, you know, I work with a lot of graduate students, for example, and it's the first time that they're this far away from their family, so they're not able to visit 
like they used to, whether it be every other weekend or even a semester or a whole year. And again, they feel a little bit more cut off and stressed. And then how we view ourselves. That, that puts us at risk or helps us manage stress. So as we've gone along, we've talked a lot about the distress action, a aspect of stress. And there are positive aspects. And we've alluded to those a little bit. And so let me go back. And we talked about athletics. And so again, it can help us concentrate and it can help us focus. So if you need to study for a test, I think we've already talked about this, you need a little bit of stress to be motivated. If you get overly stressed, motivation goes down. It helps us, it helps in our performance. It helps us practice. And, and I would substitute the word study here. You know, it's really easy to procrastinate. And then if you get enough stress, you get a little bit motivated because you want to reduce your anxiety and stress. Okay, I better go study. What happens with procrastinators, by the way, is they use procrastination to kind of amp themselves up as a motivator. I'm going to see how far I can push this back. Then I get stressed enough, right, to do it because you're not feeling it, not really wanting to get motivated. It's, a, it's an okay technique. The problem is some of us um, don't recognize when we've gone too far with our procrastination. And then we're really in trouble. And so we, we have to kind of learn from that. And it helps us get moving. Again, I use that fight or flight reaction and I know I talked that about the reptilian brain and not thinking, but sometimes it's important not to think, and if you're in danger, you get out of there. Get those muscles moving. That's positive for us. So we're going to move into kind of talking about, now you guys know about stress, how us as individuals may see stressors differently. So let's talk about what stress management is. First, we have to identify the stressful events. And one of the things that I see happen is many people don't fully identify all the stress in their life. And what they do is they tend to minimize things. For example, no, I only got four hours of sleep. Are you kidding me? No big deal. I'm used to it. Have you ever said that? I'm used to not sleeping. And what does the research say about uh, sleep? It's critical. Our body and our minds have, have to really heal during that time. So uh, the first thing I always ask people is, how many hours of sleep are you getting? Very few people are like Martha Stewart, for example, who seems to function on four or five hours of sleep. And I don't, I don't really get that because I'm not wired like that. I'm, I'm an eight to 10 person, eight to 10 hours. But some people do those lower levels. For the most of us, between six and eight hours are the minimum, and some people go even up to 10 hours. So if they're not sleeping right, that's one of the things that I work with them on is some sleep hygiene. What do you do to get ready for bed? How do you make sure you get enough rest? And a lot of folks, too, kind of postpone, oh, I'll sleep this weekend. I'll sleep this weekend. And it doesn't fully work like that. Um, because if you think about a credit card, right, versus a debit card, a debit card you're pulling out of your checking account as you go. You always know what's happening, right? With a credit card, you get interest on top of it. And then the interest compounds daily. And their math, I don't know how they do it, but somewhere then you owe more money than you ever thought you would. That's kind of what sleep deprivation does. It acts as a credit card and not a debit card. So there's no real catching up. We also have to know how our mind and body reacts to stress. And there are some people who are very, very self-aware. They know they may lose their appetite. They may increase appetite. They may not sleep well. So they, they really kind of understand that. And other people don't fully recognize what happened to them, what happens to them. And so if you're trying to do this, OK, how does my mind and body, and you're struggling with it, ask other people, because I guarantee they know how you react to stress. They, they've got a little bit of an in inventory if you ever get difficult. And so they'll give you some feedback. And I, again, I'll use myself as an example. During that crisis event, really, really busy. 
and it wasn't in the office very much. And so what I started doing, every now and then, again, not the healthiest of foods, but I would bring donuts in. And I was thinking, my staff enjoy this. It's, you know, it's donuts, right? And about a month later, I came in with some donuts, and people go, oh, no. And I said, what? And they go, you only bring donuts if you're stressed. Really? Wow. And I think what happens for me, for example, when I get really stressed, I know it's odd, because who would have thought donuts? And I started thinking about it, and what I tend to do if I get really overstressed is I start taking care of other people. I really should turn inward. But to nurture other people helps me feel good. And so I thought I was nurturing them, but that, you know, their response was, yeah, yeah. But the rest of the day, they were having to deal with me. So it was really good feedback. I've, I've learned from that. Then we have to learn what techniques work for us. Many, many people have a toolbox. The problem is the toolbox isn't very full. They only have one or two things. You know, they have a hammer and a screwdriver when they really need pliers as well. And if you, how many of you guys have ever found that you needed a hammer and you didn't have it? What, what have you guys ever used as a hammer? Ob, like object, what? Stapler. Stapler, yeah. A water bottle. A shoe, right, anything. There's certain times that, that does okay, right? That works. There's other times where you're like, yep, I need a hammer. <laughs> Didn't work. And that's the way to think about stress management techniques, too, is you have to have a variety of tools. And sometimes you can adapt them, and sometimes you can't. And then you have to put these into really daily living. Again, not just saving it up for the weekend or when you have time. And there's little bitty things that you can do each day that help you manage your stress. Here's some of the reasons why stress management techniques don't work for people. One they're unable to identify the cause of their stress. So they may say, oh, it's lack of sleep, or it's this, when really it's an occupational issue. That's got them worried. And not sleeping is actually the symptom of the stress they're experiencing. So they're not doing anything to correct the occupational issue. It can be the technique. One of the most common techniques that I see to manage stress has to do, you know, it used to be small, but now they they take up whole living rooms, but those TVs. And a lot of people think, oh, yeah, I manage stress. I watch TV. Not necessarily a good idea. How many of you, what kind of programs do you guys watch? If you have time for TV, sorry. I, I forgot who I was talking to. I know you have no trouble. In theory, what do you watch, right? Dramas. Yeah. Everything, anything? So, you know, those dramas, part of the reason why it's exciting to watch is it, it pulls you in, right? It's intense. Well, if you're at that level of intensity and you're trying to go to sleep, you may still go to sleep, but you're not as fully relaxed as you need to be. Or I have a lot of people tell me that they watch sporting events to relax and, and again I don't really get that because they're yelling and screaming at the TV and I'm like you are amped up and they're like yeah but I love it this would help you know it's like oh my gosh no let's let's have a conversation about what stress management is so it's really important to look at those techniques do they amp us up or do they relax us then also Again, do people adapt or change their type of stress management technique to fit the situation? So, for example, if I find myself, let's say, um, baths, hot baths, something that really, really helps. Well, if I start living somewhere that doesn't have a bathtub, and I don't adapt and change, it isn't going to work. I've got to have something else in that toolbox. So asking yourself, does this really work? Does this help me reduce stress? Here's some of the long-term techniques. Time management. It is probably one of the most difficult things to do to manage your time. Assertiveness, setting limits with people. I know some of you guys have to go, so please do, do what you need to do. Assertiveness is when you tell people, listen, 
I, I need to set a limit on this behavior, or I need you to do this or that. Our nutrition. And nutrition is actually something that I see that goes out the window. As an undergrad, I used to see all these people carrying around Diet Cokes in the morning, like at 8 o'clock, or coffee, and I swore to myself I would never be one of those. I was going to be water, I was going to be healthy, and I think I made it one week into grad school and I had my own, you know. And now they have the monster drinks. We didn't have those in my day, and they just keep putting more and more caffeine. So we kind of add chemicals to help ourselves. We don't eat right. And how many of you guys would agree, is nutrition something that's always one of the first things you do? I mean, when you get really stressed, do you go home and eat a salad? <laughs> no, that is not satisfying. Not at all. It's more like carbohydrates, something to feel a lot better. So it goes out the window. And in grad school, it's really easy to have happen. A lot of the students that I work with when we work on nutrition is they get to school at, at 7.30 or 8, and they get home at 10, and they never leave the school grounds. So practicing really good nutrition is a challenge. And, you know, when you live out of your backpack, it's usually not refrigerated. And so you're packing things that aren't necessarily, that they're more processed. Exercise, again, something that I see a lot of folks in their life, but particularly in grad school, that they, that, you know, you just don't have time for it anymore. I'll, I'll squeeze that in here. I'll squeeze that in there. Then relaxation exercises. This is as simple as just sitting there for five minutes and not saying or doing anything. <sighs> Taking a deep breath letting the silence fall before your knees start bouncing because you know you need to get somewhere else, but just taking a moment. Listening to music, a hot bath, anything that physiologically begins to bring you down. These are all elements that you could apply to everyday life. And the other mistake that I see people do, for example, with exercise, They've come to define exercise as being as an hour and two hours in the gym. It's walking around this building twice. It's anything that kind of gets you moving and gets your mind cleared out. So redefine for yourself what exercise is. It doesn't mean you even have to get sweaty. It, it's just moving. That can be helpful. Things to avoid. Too much TV, I gave that example already, how some of the shows can physiologically elevate you more. Alcohol is a depressant. Now, a lot of people think that alcohol actually helps you sleep better. And you may fall asleep faster after drinking because, again, it's a depressant and things are slowing down, but it disrupts your dream states. If you've had too much to drink, you never go into the deep stages of sleep that really are healing. It's what our body looks forward to every single night, and it's, it's the time our body heals. And if you never get into those deep REM states, what ends up happening is the next day you're more tired. You're not thinking as clearly, so it interferes with that. Any type of drugs, caffeine, tobacco, you know, are big ones. They're socially acceptable, so we don't find them as drugs, but they're, but they're chemicals that we put in our body, so we have to watch that. And then food. Again, many of us will use food as, as a stress reliever. And again, sometimes it's, it's not really what we eat. It may be the amount or the frequency. So how do you pull all of this together? Well. Hopefully from what you've seen from this is that when we define stress, while we're typically talking about distress, there are actually positive aspects of stress. And you can leverage those to, your exam to, to really benefit yourself. It's finding the balance. So try to find a way really to make that a, an, your ally versus your enemy. So again, if you need to get motivated for a test, then think about what window you need to be to study. You'll get a little bit physiologically elevated 
and start studying then rather than, again, procrastinating until you're almost in panic. That's, that's too far over. Identify what your stressors are. Stay away from that distress. Harder to do than it is for me to say. Then try to make a plan to reduce or eliminate some of your stressors. It may be as simple as, I always use this example, we start our day physiologically elevated. How many of you guys have an alarm clock? Is it one of those happy ones that says, welcome to the day. Thank you for joining us. Mine doesn't. What is it? That loud noise, right? And if you're in a deep sleep physiologically, what happens? You pop awake. Your heart's racing. It takes a couple of breaths. Well, oh my gosh, we've just set the tone for the day. Then most of us are really so busy that we build about 30 seconds to a minute leeway to get out the door to be on time. So if you get the wrong pair of shoes on, or the dog throws up, or the kids need something, you're already late. Now you're stressed. Then you get in traffic, and what happens? Yeah, more stress, more stress. And it just continues through the day. Try to apply those daily stress relievers, simple as a hot bath, simple as five minutes to yourself. That's all. It doesn't have to be long periods of time. Other ways to prevent stress, regular exercise routine, a balanced diet, practicing the skills we talked about, then identify and minimize those stressors. Find help when you need it. Ask for help. Say, you know, I'm overwhelmed. Can you just talk to me? Let's go do something. And finally, I really like to remind folks and this is the last thought of the program is that ounce of prevention really is worth a pound of cure. If from the outset we can manage our stressors, if we know that this test is coming up, what do I need to feel better? Okay, I need to back up my studying time. I need to make sure I have healthy foods here. How can I manage my time? Then you're not as stressed going into that test. But again, it's hard to do because all you're thinking about is success or getting to do what you need to do and going from there. So again, if you can minimize and mitigate, you'll find yourself a lot further in managing your stress. And that's it. I know folks have to get places. and.